Welcome to a cautious case for climate optimism with Project Drawdowns, Jonathan Foley. Um, I'm Abby Finnis. I'm a principal planner at Local Climate Solutions. I also host a podcast called City Climate Corner with uh, my friend, Representative Larry Kraft, who uh, successfully just voted to uh, on the House floor to pass 100% carbon-free legislation. So we are on our way. <laughs> Uh, the Great Northern shares dozens of performances, art installations, outdoor activi activities, um, and solution-focused climate talks during the last week of January and the first week of February that invigorate mind and body. Um, they also would like us to do a land acknowledgement, um, but I'm going to take a little liberty with that, and I want to tell you a little bit about where we are right now. Uh, we are in a neighborhood called the Phillip Community in South Minneapolis. Um, I grew up about a mile east of where we are right now uh, and went to Anderson Elementary, which is just a few blocks away from here. And I don't know if the school still does this. I don't think so. But when I was there, they would have Ojibwe elders come in and they told us traditional stories, shared their language, taught us to bead. Um, and I remember one woman very clearly. Uh, I remember how she smelled. I remember her strong, knobby fingers, delicately working with the beads. Um, and it was just a really cool experience as, you know, kindergarten, first, second, young elementary students. Um, and the reason that we were able to do that is because the Little Earth community is also in the Phillips community. Um, and so we had a number of tribal elders who were able to come and share that with us. The Phillips community is bordered by three highways and a major arterial road. Parts of it are heavily industrialized and residents continue to breathe polluted air and play in toxic soil. It's one of the most polluted residential communities in the state. It's a designated green zone by the city and environmental justice area of concern, according to our state agency. Um, and yet, we continue to make decisions that harm the people in the community, particularly residents of Little Earth. And so, yes, let's acknowledge that the land that we're meeting on today was the land of the Dakota people. But let's also confront the hard truths of our state's history and the injustices that persist. Uh, we won't just thank Dakota and Anishinaabe people for the ongoing care of the land, but also support land back efforts and the preservation of their rich cultures. And through climate action, let's detoxify pollution in our communities. And so I am very excited about our conversation today because I think we are talking about more than just reducing emissions. We're talking about a vision of a world that we can live in that is healthy for everyone. And so on behalf of the Great Northern, I want to thank the Climate Series sponsors, McKnight Foundation, Minneapolis Foundation, Ascob Fainless, and uh, Polestar Minneapolis, the Carlson Family Foundation for their support of these important conversations, in addition to the many organizations and individuals that contribute to the festival annually. And if you would like to support these efforts, these ongoing festivals, you can make a contribution at the website, thegreatnorthernfestival.com. Now, to our speaker. Our guest for this session is Dr. Jonathan Foley, a world-renowned environmental scientist, sustainability exer expert, author, and public speaker. His work is focused on understanding our changing planet and finding new solutions to change the climate, ecosystems, and natural resources we all depend on. John's groundbreaking research and insights have led him to become a trusted advisor to governments, foundations, non-governmental organizations, and business leaders around the world. He and his colleagues have made major contributions to our understanding of global ecosystems, food security, and the environment, climate change, and sustainability of the world's resources. He's published more than 130 peer-reviewed scientific articles, including many highly cited works in Science, Nature, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. In 2014, Thomas Reuters named him a highly cited researcher in ecology and environmental science, placing him among the top 1% most cited global scientists. So please give him a warm welcome. Well, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be speaking to you uh, uh, about climate change and you know things that can be kind of depressing, but actually to turn it into a more hopeful and kind of action uh, frame conversation, which I hope to do today. Uh, it's also nice to be at the Great Northern in a festival that just celebrates places like Minnesota and the seasons that we have, including winter, uh, which is just lovely. And, and the fact that so many people came out to talk about climate change on a day that's really freaking cold uh, is kind of cool. Only in Minnesota. That's great. Um, also, um, 
uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Project Drawdown, which started off in the Bay Area, but now, strangely, has more staff in St. Paul than it does in the entire state of California. So uh, we've kind of moved back to Minnesota, if you will. Uh, I'm, I was here a long time ago at the University of Minnesota for a number of years, then um, moved to San Francisco, but I'm kind of back home now and uh, actually now living in Owatonna, Minnesota. So uh, Drawdown isn't just fly-in territory. We're not just flying in, we're here. Uh, from Otana to Duluth, we've got staff covering the whole state here and the rest of the nation. So uh, it's really great to be connected to Minnesota folks talking about climate solutions. So what I wanna do today is really talk about climate solutions and the science we need to know to kind of get that right, but also build a case, I hope, for a little bit more kind of optimism or a little bit more of a sense of possibility and dare I say, a little bit of a flicker of hope. Uh, and when we talk about climate change, because you know that's not the default position of our community sometimes, is it? Uh, we often are talking about doom and gloom kind of issues. It can provoke a lot of anxiety, a lot of anger, understandably. And that's right, that's fair, and that's reasonable. But there are other areas to talk about and other emotions to experience, which I think will help lead us to a little bit more action if we can see the possibilities, not just the harm. If we can see some optimism, not just the doom and despair, maybe we can move a little quicker to what we can do. And I'd just like to help build the case for that today. And then, you know, just have a conversation with everybody today about what we can do together to advance that kind of problem uh, into a real suite of solutions. But what we're gonna do today is kind of talk about climate change. And before we do that, um, it's useful to start from the beginning, which is like, how the hell did we get here? You know, what, why are we in this big mess anyway? Well, one of the things I think is useful to think about is our time in history, because we've just transversed an incredible few decades of human history where, you know, we've increased the number of people in the world. We've suddenly become a much more urban population. Okay, I'm just trying to get the clicker to work here. Uh, we've become a, a large and now predominantly urban species. But the real story of the, the last 50 years or so is this incredible growth of a capitalist-fueled consumer kind of economy that's touching all corners of the world. And that is just an extraordinary shift in human history that happened basically in the lifetime of folks in this room. One of the things I find just so astonishing to remember is that during the last 50 years, our population more than doubled during that time. Hmm, this clicker is not quite working for me, is it? Sorry about that. Maybe if I stand over here. Ah, oh, there we go, okay. But I blew past it. Come on, folks. Oh, come on. My fault. Should have checked the technology a little more before. Okay, so during the last 50 years, what we've seen is that the world's population has more or less doubled during that time, but the economy adjusted for inflation and everything else has grown almost sixfold during the same period. So we have about twice as many people, but we're doing six times more stuff during that same period of time, including about a tripling of global food demand, a rough doubling of global water use, and a near tripling of fossil fuel combustion during the last 50 years. And in other words, what's kind of fascinating to me is when you think about this, is that we've changed more in the last 50 years than we did in all human history combined before that. So that's the thing that's really extraordinary. In 50 years, we've outpaced all human evolution, all human history combined during our lifetime. That's an extraordinary moment. It's kind of an inflection point in the history of our species. And it certainly had a toll on the global environment, whether it's looking at um, rainforest around the world. For example, this is a satellite image of uh, Rondonia in, um, in Brazil looking at rainforests that are more or less pristine um, during the 1970s. But we go back to the exact same place a few decades later. We see it widely cleared, mainly to grow soybeans. And those soybeans are mostly being shipped to China in the form of animal feed. This is to actually feed pork production in China. As China became wealthier, more urban, it dramatically increased its pork consumption. And the grain for that is being grown in the rainforest of the Amazon for the most part and in the United States. So globalization has had a huge impact on landforms around the world, including the world's forest. And during the last few decades, we've lost about 30% of the world's tropical forest. That's one big environmental change we have caused in this last few decades. We've also seen a massive decline in water resources. Uh, the Aral Sea in the former Soviet Union used to be one of the largest inland seas in the world, but today it looks more like this. What caused that? No, not climate change. What caused that is we dammed up the water and used it to irrigate the deserts of Kazakhstan to grow cotton for international export. 
truly insane, but you dammed up the river, you dammed up the water supply of the Aral Sea, and guess what happens? It disappeared. Uh, by the way, that, that distance that it moved was about 300 miles, about the width of you know, Lake Superior, pretty much. This is a huge dramatic change. We have to remake globes today with the Aral Sea, not a sea anymore, but just desert. So these are very obvious changes to the environment that we've caused. And now, of course, we're seeing not just land and water, we're also changing the sky. And that's the problem of climate change, how we've changed the atmosphere and the oceans and the climate system of this world. Now, I don't need to remind you of all this, but just to make sure we're all kind of on the same page, what's happening is very obvious. We are increasing the level of kind of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, since the 19th century, and CO2 levels today are about 50% higher than they should be. That's 50% higher than they've been in about 5 million years, in fact, during this era of Earth's history. Nothing like this should be happening. CO2, like methane and nitrous oxide and other gases we pollute the atmosphere with, trap infrared radiation or heat, and that's warming the planet. You all know this, and this has been happening. And so along with this rise in pollution has been a rise in temperatures. And we can see that here. Um, if I can get the thing to work, there we go. Uh, and the world has warmed about 1 to 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than it should be. That's also about 1 to 1.2 degrees warmer than the Earth has been at all in the last 5 million years. So this is also unusual. Now, you might think, like, well, 1 degree, that doesn't sound like a lot. Well, the Earth's last ice age, about 20,000 years ago, was about 4 degrees colder than normal. We're already 1.2 degrees warmer than normal and continuing to warm. So the kind of changes you see with the ice age uh, in the cold direction could be heading our way in the warm direction, basically a planet you and I wouldn't recognize, and certainly not one that could have a thriving economy, civilization, and security, and justice, and equity for people. It's going to be really messy if we keep going in that direction. One thing I want to note, though, we've all seen graphs like this. Um, one thing I do want to mention, just because it's a historical important note, the first person to talk about this, and it's a scientific problem, wasn't who I was taught in graduate school. I was told it was somebody named Joseph Tyndall first wrote about climate change in the 1860s, saying if CO2 went up, so would the temperatures. Guess what? It wasn't Joseph Tyndall. It was an American woman named Eunice Foote, F-O-O-T-E, who published her paper in 1853 and was then conveniently ignored for almost 170 years. It was only in the last 10 years or so people rediscovered her work and realized it was an American woman who's also a leader in the suffrage movement in this country who actually was the first person to write about this, but then was basically erased from history. So let's put her back into history, please. Can you all remember that? Eunice Foote, 1853, not 1953, 1853, uh, about the time this graph was beginning. She kind of knew what was going to happen here, and by God, she was unfortunately right, but as a really pretty important footnote to the history of science. So we've known about the climate problem for a long time, and guess what? The science has been um, astonishingly accurate. Not only are temperatures rising, changes are happening, of course, to things like water, to ice, to uh, our ecosystems, our food systems, our, our, you know, just our very lives, including the erasure of Muir Glacier in Alaska, which is now has to be called Muir Lake because the glacier is gone. So this is kind of extraordinary changes are happening very quickly around us, and this can be pretty alarming. Now, of course, a lot of you are familiar with this issue because you came to a talk like this. You probably care about this issue a lot. And right now, I would say a lot of folks today feel, not everybody, but a lot of folks feel kind of a sense of hopelessness when it comes to climate change, that it seems like the problem's getting bigger every day. We're seeing more and more alarming signs, more and more trends. It doesn't feel like we're really doing anything if you only listen to traditional media. Yeah, because it's trying to scare the hell out of you and sell you stuff. It's scaring you. That's not the whole story. This is true. Some of it is scary. Some of it is bad. Absolutely. But I'm going to show you later, you're only hearing half the story. There's another half of the story where things are actually getting kind of better. And there's a lot of momentum building for doing incredible climate action. And we're living in the tension between those two worlds. We're effectively in a race between the world getting a lot worse and our capacity to make it better, improving every day. I don't know which one's going to win, but I know which one I'm working on. 
So I'm gonna build that case for you that there's actually more to hope for than maybe you thought before. But it does feel hopeless. I'll urge you to believe for a moment anyway that it's not necessarily hopeless. It, it, it's up to what we decide to do and we still have a shot at this. And I really wanna urge you to remember the future is always being built. Tomorrow is not completely written yet. We still can affect it today. So this is what we need to do is figure out how we're gonna build the future we want and problem of climate change before it gets truly, truly horrific. So that's what our organization called Project Drawdown is all about. We're focusing on getting the world to achieve drawdown. Well, what is drawdown? What does that even mean? Well, drawdown goes back to this graph. This is the level of all greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They've been building and building and building. The higher this red curve goes, the more crap is in the atmosphere. The more crap is in the atmosphere, the warmer the planet gets. The warmer it gets, the more destabilized things get, the worse things get, and the more problems we're gonna have. So the problem here is what happens next? Does that curve just continue to rise into the future, going up and up and up, causing more mayhem, or do we bend the curve and change the course of history? Well, I want us to work together and figure out how we can change the future and bend the curve and go to this moment here, this blue dot, that's the one we're just singularly focused on because that's the moment of drawdown. Drawdown doesn't mean pulling carbon out of the sky. What it means is it's the moment we pollution. It's the moment when greenhouse gas levels finally stabilize, and then maybe we begin to draw them down. But first we have to stop the pollution, then we can worry about the rest. But this is the moment we're focusing on. Other people call it net zero. We historically have just called it the moment we begin drawdown. That's the moment we stop climate change from getting any worse. So the sooner we get to drawdown, the sooner we stop it from getting warmer and getting worse. That's what we're trying to do. And let's get here as quickly and safely and as equitably as humanly possible. That's our mission. So how do we do that? Well, the reason the greenhouse gases are building up in the atmosphere is because we're adding crap to the sky, <laughs> okay? Bottom line. That's where this stuff comes from. These are the six primary sources of greenhouse gas pollution. You'll see words like electricity, food, which is surprisingly large, industry, transportation, buildings, other energy-related kind of emissions. Now, these are global numbers. Uh, those percentages will be very different from Minnesota versus, uh, you know, Maine versus, you know, Bolivia. It varies like crazy around the world, but this is the global total. So this is the crap we put in the atmosphere, and that's what's built up in the atmosphere. But we're not the only things happening on this planet, of course. There's also biology and other physics and chemistry that are um, going on, too. And it turns out that some of our greenhouse gas pollution, about half of the carbon dioxide we emit, is actually being pulled out of the atmosphere by nature and has been since the beginning. Uh, these are what we call carbon sinks. Uh, right today, they're basically on land, in forest, and in oceans, just in the water and through basically phytoplankton and algae and things like this. This is nature. This is not us. And I'll talk about that more in, the min in a minute. But nature is removing a, a little more than half of our CO2 and a little bit of the other greenhouse gases. So on balance, we're putting in about 100 units of crap into the atmosphere. Nature is removing uh, about 40 or so, leaving behind roughly 60 uh, units, or about well, 59% of our pollution stays in the atmosphere. And that's the part that's building up year over year over year, causing climate change to get worse. So if we want to kind of stop the climate problem, we can work on both sides of that equation a little bit and see what we can do and all those different levers to address the problem. And that's what I want to show you today. How do we actually stop climate change? Well, first and foremost, you can't not do this. You have to start at the source, which is where the pollution begins. How do we stop mass pollution in all of these different areas of our economy? Well, there are a lot of ways we can do that, and I'm going to show them to you later. We can also work on the other side of the street, especially with nature, and focus on things like what we call the natural sinks of carbon in oceans, in forest. That's basically making sure nature can continue to do what it's doing now. And maybe if we're really clever and we work really hard, we can add to that a little bit in things like agriculture with maybe, uh, or carbon removal schemes, we can plant more trees than exist today, things like that. But the first job is to protect what's already there because it's so vast and so crucial to the health of our planet. So that's what we're going to talk about today is, you know, how can we basically stop climate change? And I just want to walk you through the basic areas we need to work on. 
Uh, one thing I'm just going to say right now, there's no silver bullet to stopping climate change at all. But a metaphor that uh, seems to work well in America, there's no silver bullet, but there's a lot of silver buckshot out there, folks. Lots of little pieces, and if Adam gets the job done. Let's go through that. Well, to stop climate change, we have to work across different parts of the economy. Globally, it's a little bit more than a third in the US, but in the, in the world as a whole, about 25% of our climate change problem comes from burning coal and natural gas to make electricity. So about a quarter of the problem is electricity. Interestingly, about an equal amount is caused by the food system. Uh, most of that's from deforesting rainforests to grow more crops, especially cattle and animal feed and palm oil, uh, but also from methane from our animals, especially cattle and dairy cows, also to using too much fertilizer. Nitrous oxide is a, a source of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, particularly in the upper Midwest, for example. We don't talk about enough. Then we go to other sectors of the economy that also need to change uh, to reduce. There we go. Uh, is industry, basically making and processing waste, whether it's steel or concrete or polymers or glass, things like that are big kind of carbon emitters. And then we have things like um, transportation here. About 14% of our emissions come from transportation, most of that in cars, but also ships, rail, airplanes, things like that too. And then we have buildings, which uh, some people are surprised. They think oh, buildings must emit more than 6%. Yes, they do. They, but that's counted in the electricity column because the electricity used in buildings, the emissions don't happen in the building, they happen at the power plant. So you count them over there, but buildings affect that a lot. And also buildings are made out of stuff like concrete and glass and steel, which are counted over in the industry column. So it turns out the building's emissions here we're talking about are from the building itself. So that means furnaces, boilers, hot water heaters, leaking air conditioners, things like that. But when you add together the effect of the built environment, it's about a third or 40% of the total. So how we build and live in cities and towns across the world is hugely important too. And then we get everything else, the last 10%, which is uh, mainly stuff in the energy business, like refining crude oil into things we use, you know, uh, gasoline, diesel fuel, jet fuel, um, heating oil, things like that, but also mining oil and natural gas, especially the so-called fugitive emissions and flaring of natural gas is a really big part of this too. Uh, but basically on one hand is 90% of the problem, electricity, food, industry, transportation, and buildings. The mix will depend where you are, but whether it's Minnesota or someplace else, the percentage will change a lot, but basically you always have to think about those five things, how you make and use electricity, how you make and use food, how you build and sell stuff, transportation, and the built environment. Those are the five biggies that every place has to think about, including here. So that's what we have to think about. Well, at Project Drawdown, we've gone through all of these and identified viable solutions that are here right now available today. We've done the math, we've crunched the numbers, we've looked at this stuff backward, forward, sideways, and upside down, and found the solutions we would say are the viable climate solutions for today. And we need them today not 20 years in the future, 30 years in the future, that's great, but we need solutions today to begin to bend the curve now. And so we build what we call a solutions library of about 100 very well-tested, very verifiable, viable climate solutions. So that when we put up climate solutions, we know these work, they can scale, and most of them actually can save us money today. So these are good solutions that work right now. Um, if we look at what we have to do in electricity, First, we have to think about using less electricity. Let's conserve electricity, let's use less of it. Let's be more efficient with electricity, no matter how it's produced. People don't wanna talk about this. They'd rather talk about nuclear power or solar panels or wind, how we make electricity. We start by asking, why are we using so darn much? Because we're wasting a lot of it. So a lot of the energy efficiency measures are still low hanging fruits, haven't been picked yet, and there are lots of them. And a lot of the electricity we use, again, about half of it goes to buildings, about half goes to industry, and the other 2% is everything else, including like vehicles, transportation, blah, blah, blah. So mainly it's buildings and industry are places with huge opportunities for energy efficiency. And then we can make the electricity in low carbon ways. So when we look at climate solutions, we always start with efficiency first, because why waste a resource? And then how do we make it without emitting greenhouse gases? 
So we have two big clusters of solutions. Like this is um, very, very good opportunities for energy efficiency, and here are ways to make electricity without emitting CO2. The bigger the circle in this graph means the bigger the opportunity this solution has around the world. So bigger circles means bigger solutions. And we got a whole bunch of them. And again, not a silver bullet, but lots of silver buckshot. We see a lot of friends in here like wind and solar uh, utility scale, like solar farms, but also distributed, which means like on your rooftop. We need both. We need wind, we need onshore and offshore. We need hydro, we need methane, we need geothermal. We have a little bit of nuclear in here too. The, a lot of people like to debate that. We see lots of different things here, but these are solutions that can work today. In the future, maybe fusion will be on this list. Uh, I've been hearing about fusion since the 1980s, and it's, uh, it was 20 years away then, and still is, um, 40 years later, but uh, hopefully someday it'll be on the table. But for now, these things work now. These are turnkey, shovel-ready solutions that work today. If we go to food and land use and agriculture, we also see similar kinds of things. Again, the emissions come mainly from deforestation in the tropics, methane from animals, including from here, uh, and nitrous oxide, which we don't talk about enough, from fertilizers and manure, which is one of the single biggest emissions of the average Walmart store is beef fed by corn, fertilized too much by synthetic chemicals, is one of the biggest emissions in a typical like store in America. And we don't talk about that enough. That's a big one. And other kind of emissions. And again, similarly, we can talk about making the food system more efficient by reducing food waste, turns out to be one of the biggest climate solutions we've ever looked at because 30 to 40% of all the food on earth is never eaten and is thrown away. Not just in the US, on earth, total. That's extraordinary. Also eating more plant-rich diets. We're not saying everybody has to become vegetarian or vegan, but we could all be, well, at least some people in the world, most Americans could eat a little less red meat and dairy, for example. That would be healthy for us human health-wise, but also for the planet. But it's not all or nothing. We can shift the balance. But then we can also protect ecosystems from being cleared and then farm the lands we have left much more sustainably. And so that's a really great set of solutions. Too. Again, a little bit of efficiency, a little bit of protection, and a little bit of innovation. We can do far more. I won't go through the rest in such detail, but in industry, we have to think about things like steel, concrete, which is a huge a concrete, if it were a country, would be the fourth largest emitter in the world after China the United States and India, then it would be all the world's concrete. <laughs> so, you know, that's a big one. It's bigger than Germany's emissions or something. It's huge. Uh, we also have to think about uh, steel. We have to think about plastics. We have to think about glass. We also have to think about waste processing and how much, you know, like recycling would help take a bit out of that 3% there. Things like this. We also have to focus on transportation. This is one we can all relate to because we're, you know, some of the big drivers behind that, no pun intended. Um, but that's 14%. Most of that's cars. Uh, flying, um, a lot of people focus on flying because it's less than 2% of the world emits more than 2% of our emissions in flying. It's very few people doing a lot of travel in airplanes. It's kind of the culprit here. But it's materially, it's about 2%, and that's including the military as well. But it's important. Every percent matters. And that number is growing a lot. So that's one people are kind of watching carefully and seeing how we can cut out some of the more wasteful bits of that, like private airplanes or, you know, trips that could have been a Zoom call, that kind of thing. So we need to work on that one, too. And then we get to other kinds of emissions like buildings uh, on top of the electricity they use and the materials that are made out of is the operations of the buildings themselves, uh, especially heating and cooling of buildings directly. Uh, turns out residential buildings are about two thirds the problem. Commercial and public buildings are about one third the problem. And for the most part, the buildings that this planet will see in 2050 are already built, except for in some rapidly developing parts of the world. We're talking about retrofitting lots of the world's buildings, uh, not just building new. We have to do both. So when we put that all together, we see a lot of solutions to climate change are, are working solutions in electricity, in food, industry, transport, and buildings, those are all the things we need to do. And obviously a lot of collaboration and multifaceted efforts are needed here. We also though need to work on those carbon sinks. Sometimes that's called carbon removal. Uh, we hear a lot about the possible technologies out there that could suck carbon out of the sky and put it below ground. Um, well, those are basically zero today. There are a lot of efforts trying to do that, but even if they grew by a million fold, they'd still be too small to measure in the atmosphere. So for the foreseeable future, at least for the next decade or so, that's gonna be relatively small. What's really doing the work is nature. It's the world's forest and the world's oceans are absorbing carbon, not us. 
So we need to be first primarily focusing on how we protect nature, like rainforest, boreal forest, temperate forest, all of those. How do we protect them so they can keep doing that job? How do we protect ocean areas, coastal oceans in particular, like mangroves, saltwater marshes, these kinds of places? How do we make sure they continue to be healthy and absorb carbon? But also offshore, coral reefs, kelp forest, things of that nature. Those are also critical. And down the road, yes, we will build machines in ways that maybe suck carbon out of the air as well. But realistically, at a global scale of impact, that's at least 20 years away. So we should continue to do the R&D and the scale up and the investment. But in the meantime, let's protect the trees and the oceans because they're doing most of the work right now. So we'll do both. Another area of climate solutions, though, I want to mention between the sources and the sinks is a third one that people don't talk about enough. And it's really about strengthening societies, things you don't do for climate purposes, things we do for humanitarian purposes, for human rights, for equity, for justice, but then turn out to have additional benefits back to climate. Two of them that we've identified that have you know, really good numbers behind them that are you know, truly measurable impacts on climate are one, helping indigenous communities in the world, especially those who live in forest, protect their land. When indigenous communities have better land tenure and legal rights to their land, there's less deforestation, less illegal land grabbing, less illegal logging, and those forests stay intact. That reduces deforestation emissions and preserves a carbon sink. It's a win-win-win for people and emissions and nature all at the same time. Another area is investing in women and girls, having more access to family planning around the world in rich countries and poor countries and everybody in between, better parity and access of education. And every time you see this, you also see demographic, economic, and societal trends that end up lowering emissions as well. So by investing in indigenous communities, investing more in women and girls, we see numbers that quantify how emissions go down when you do that. So let's make sure we invest in people too while we're thinking of climate change and look at the big picture, that it's not just technology fixes, it's a little bit of everything. It's things like you know, how we work with sources, how we work with sinks, how we improve societies. These are all the kind of drawdown solutions we've identified so far and more are coming every year whether those solutions are in electricity or whether they're over in food or over in transportation or whether they're in the kind of human rights space, these are all critical solutions that can help us address climate change in multiple, multiple ways. And when we do, this is what I wanna offer you some hope with, is with the solutions we already have today, we can see many different pathways. It just depends how much we want to push this, how far and how quickly we move these solutions out into scale. But we would argue right now, it is still at least theoretically possible to stop climate change from getting much worse than about 1.5 degrees, which is incredibly ambitious. I acknowledge that it may be out of reach politically and societally, at least it looks that way right now, but we don't know. Uh, but two degrees is certainly doable, and everything in between is what we would argue is very doable with today's technologies. If people tell you, no, we don't have the tools to stop climate change, that's BS. That's just not true. Uh, and if they tell you, oh, it's going to be too expensive, that's also BS. That's not true either. Uh, what pe when people tell you something's too expensive or it's not possible, kind of ask where they're coming from. <laughs> Often the subtitle that you don't have said out loud is, this is extremely inconvenient for me and my industry, so please stop talking about it. Um, but in reality, actually, we can do this. And again, if you do the numbers, what we find is um, when we look at climate solutions, saying which are the least expensive over here, these are the cheapest ones on the left, and what are the most expensive? Yeah, initially, we're going to have to spend some money. We're going to spend about $25 trillion as a world between now and 2050, let's say. But when we do that, Guess what? With the savings we're going to have compared to a fossil fueled world, which also costs money to maintain and build out, by the way, a lot of money, and also the kind of new revenues we'll create with new technologies, and not to mention, which isn't even counted on this graph, we avoided destroying the planet, which might be worth something to somebody someday. Um, that isn't even counted here, by the way. Destroying the planet is a little bonus we get for this. But even without that, which is untold trillions of dollars, we spend 25 trillion, we'll make about 140 trillion because 80% of climate solutions make you money. That's kind of amazing. 80% of the tools we have now will make you pretty darn good money now. Only 20% would truly have to be subsidized. 
and we can make those cheaper as we begin to invest in this. But the bottom line is we spend about 28 trillion, we'll make 145 between now and 2015. Oh yeah, as a bonus, we get to save a world. That's pretty good. That's the best case for business in human history. And anybody who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you some oil, okay? That's just nonsense. So we can change that. So I hope I'm building a little bit of a case of saying, look, we have learned a few things about climate solutions, one of which is we have them. We actually have enough solutions today, and a lot of them are growing rapidly, not rapidly enough at the moment, but they're growing exponentially and just give it a little more time and you'll see some amazing progress. And we have enough solutions now to stop climate change and more are coming every day, which is fantastic. The other good thing we've learned about climate solutions is they make the world better. They clean the air. They avoid catastrophic impacts of climate change. They often create new jobs. They also take power away from maybe organizations we're not so happy with. Um, maybe if we do them right, they can improve equity and justice around the world and also help us solve some other big problems we have too. This is why climate justice issues are so, so, so critical because we have to do these things at the same time, make a more equitable and just world while we're also addressing an environmental crisis. Good news is we can. And climate solutions are good for jobs in places like Minnesota and beyond. They're good for inflation. You know that climate bill we just got passed? Remember what it was called? <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act? Maybe that's why it got passed? Um, that works. Security, health, equity, justice, climate solutions are really, really good for us. I, I, I swear to God, I, I think when we start to really take a big bite out of climate change, we're going to turn around and say, what the heck took us so long? This stuff is fantastic. Why did we wait so long? And I think you know the answer. Uh, but I think what we will find is the benefits of climate action are huge and felt by most of the world, and we can do a really good job with this. So let's move on. The other thing is that I think is surprising to people is if you just listen to kind of the average news station, you might think like, oh, climate change is just getting worse. I just hear more and more about the bad news, the impacts, the droughts, the floods, the disasters. Yes, that's all happening. 99% of American news coverage, though, is only focused on the damages and the nasty politics. Less than 1% of media coverage on climate in America even begins to talk about solutions or the incredible people who are doing them around the country and in your communities. Why aren't we doing that? Well, I think it's the business model of media. Just it, it bleeds, it leads. Bad news sells better than good news. But it turns out there is some good news. Uh, quiz time. How many countries in the world do you think out of 200 and something countries in the world, how many of them are lowering their emissions significantly, would you say right now? Anybody? Two, three, a dozen? Uh, 200. Wow. That's same. Okay. Not, no, I wish. <laughs> I wish. Uh, well, it turns out it's about 40 of them, including this one. Uh, a lot of people are very surprised to find out the United States is actually among the countries leading the world on cutting emissions. Uh, in fact, since 2007, the United States has been cutting its emissions by about 20%. So even though our Congress did not pass the Kyoto Protocols, in fact, they voted not to even consider it in 1997. The U.S. Senate voted 97 to zero to not even talk about the Kyoto Protocols. We beat them anyway, without government. They didn't do it at all. It was states and cities, businesses and NGOs that did the work. Then we had a cap and trade bill put forward in the first year of the Obama administration. Democrats had huge majorities in the House, in the Senate, popular new president, tried to get a cap and trade bill, died in flames. And that was saying, by 2020, we should cut emissions by 20%, and nobody thought it was possible. Well, the bill failed, we didn't do the bill, and guess what, the country did it anyway, without federal action, or not a lot of federal action. Again, the power of local communities, states like Minnesota who've been leading, but also businesses, communities, and NGOs, we did the heavy lifting. Now, finally, we have an Inflation Reduction Act, which is working on this too, but the US already cut its emissions by 20%, and before some smart ass asked me this, I'll tell you right now, no, we didn't export all that to China. In fact, China's emissions didn't have anything to do with that. Those are real emissions. If you look at the total US economy, whether it's in the US or China or wherever else, that also went down by 20% when you adjust for trade balances. So it went down in the US territories by 20% and our economic footprint went down 
while the economy grew and our population grew in the US. So we've made a huge dent. You know what country's number one on this list? The, no, no, the UK. The UK has lowered its emissions by 40%. In fact, all the 40 countries have been lowering emissions are capitalist Western democracies, basically. Mostly Europe, the US, not Canada, not Australia so much, but New Zealand, Japan, OECD countries pretty much. So we have made some progress and most people don't know that. And guess what? Before the Inflation Reduction Act, we were on track to have our emissions lowered to about 30% by 2030 already. And now, thanks to the federal government really stepping up and adding a lot of juice to this, we're going to about 40% or more. I think, in fact, it's gonna be a lot more than that. So that's really good news. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is putting about 35 billion a year into climate solutions. The private sector is putting in, in this country alone, about 120 billion a year, about three to four times that much. So we need government and we need states uh, acting. We need communities and we need the private sector. And now it's starting to get interesting. And some really big things are starting to happen. But you know what's funny? When I tell people that, they're like, oh my God, how could that be true? Because I keep on thinking we're stuck. We're not doing anything, even though we are. And that's the last thing I want to talk to you about. Why does it feel like we're stuck on climate change? Why does it feel like the only the bad news side of the street is true? The good news doesn't exist, but it does. Why is that? Well, it's a funny paradox, and I think it has to do with just the state of all of our conversations in this country, because they often feel kind of like this. Why are we so kind of polarized? Because we're supposed to be. <laughs> Somebody's doing this to us. Uh, politicians are good at this. Activists are good at this. And our media empires make billions off of dividing us and scaring the hell out of us. Whether it's about the economy, race, crime, whatever, and climate change, scaring people is a great business model. So what's really weird in America today is that here's a few astonishing facts about climate communication in the US. Did you know that actually 90 to 92% of Americans believe climate change is real today? Doesn't feel like that because the 8% who don't are given a big fat megaphone on Fox News every day and everywhere else as if it's 50-50. It's not. It's about the same number that believes the earth is flat, okay? I'm not worried about them. There's always some crazy 8% of people doing something, but 90 something percent, I'll take it. That's a win. Why don't we just move on? We don't need to debate whether climate change is real anymore. We won that 20 years ago. Well, guess what else is true? It turns out that about 60% of Americans are alarmed and concerned about climate change in every poll everywhere. But rather than empowering people to do stuff about this, they're just alarmed and basically freaked out. So we're not empowering people, we're scaring people. And so what we find now is instead of more action from those same people, they're reporting rates of climate anxiety, depression, fear, instead of empowerment. And you know, like, wow, we could do something about this. This is awesome. We could solve this problem. People are afraid and understandably so, but only because they're hearing what makes them afraid, not what makes them inspired or informed or empowered. So we need to change this conversation because you know this is not good just to inform people and scare people to the point of anxiety where they pull away. We need everybody to lean in exactly at this moment. The other thing that's really weird is even though people believe in climate change and they're freaked out about it, fewer than 2% of Americans in every Gallup poll ever taken ever have listed the environment or climate change as a quote, top issue facing them or the nation. So we're freaked out. We're worried about it, we believe it, but it's not really on people's everyday list of things that they're worried about as a top priority. Only 2% of Americans, that's the environmental community. The other 98% of our friends are actually worried about other stuff a little bit more. And we need to listen to them. They're not gonna become us. They're not becoming Greta Thunberg. We have to go to them and ask, what can we do for you? Because what most people in the country are really concerned about are the kitchen table issues, jobs, cost of living, uh, security, health, equity and justice, what's going on in our communities, what's happening in your daily lives. Well, good news, climate change solutions are good for these things. So rather than trying to get people to be worried about our issues, how about we go to them and say, we can help you with yours. And we find a different kind of way of talking about it. So that's the thing I think we need to fix to make hope and optimism and empowerment part of the toolbox we have to motivate much more climate action by moving the needle here. We have to shift the tone about talking about climate change. We don't, we don't tell a happy-go-lucky story where everything's fine. 
bad news is happening, but can we shift the tone a little bit more to talk at least equally about here are our problems and here are our solutions. We have the opportunity to fix this problem. Can we change that 1% of media coverage from about solutions to maybe 10 or 20? Would that be okay? I'm not saying even 50, that'd be too much to hope for, but could we increase a little bit more just so people know there are solutions? How would you like a doctor that walks into the waiting room and pulls up the x-ray and looks at your chair and says, oh, dude, you're you you're done for. You're sick. Oh, my God. And just, I'm out of here. Bye. And just walks out. That's what we're doing on climate change. We're just telling people, hey, you're really screwed. I'm out of here. Bye. But we're not. We don't have to be. We should have the other half of the conversation and talk about solutions and why they're good for you. The other thing we can do is you know, shift from doom and despair being the only emotion we feel. It's one of them. But what about that sense of possibility and opportunity? What reminds people we're one of the first generations of human history that could reach a world that is actually truly just and equitable and sustainable? It's at least within our grasp. For the first time in human history, we could eradicate hunger and poverty and inequities and unsustainable practices. We haven't yet, but it's at least theoretically possible. No other people in human history could have said that. Can we at least talk about the possibility of a better world? Because it's really possible, but we don't talk about it enough. And then finally, can we shift the focus to things that actually do matter to the other 98% of our friends and neighbors in all the country and meet people where they are, not where we want them to be? And again, most people care about other issues than climate change a little bit more. For example, like the economy, health, community, equity, justice issues, things that are happening around us every day. And again, climate solutions are part of what can help that. They create jobs, they can create more equitable and more just communities, they improve our health, they improve our security. So why don't we meet people where they are and say, hey, we're here to help. And that's better than scaring them. The other thing, and I wanna just do a little uh, seed for tonight, by the way, a little advertisement. Later today, Project Drawdown is gonna be introducing a film series talking about climate heroes in this community. Uh, these are heroines and heroes who are doing incredible climate action on the ground in the Twin Cities and around Minnesota, a lot of whom you might not have heard about. A lot of them are led by people of color, led by women um, leaders, others that maybe haven't had the spotlight as much as they should. And so a big effort we have at Project Drawdown led by Matt Scott and his team, some of who are in the audience here, you'll see them later tonight, uh, is to help pass the mic Ironically, as a middle-aged, overeducated white guy, uh, we need to pass the mic more to say, hey, you shouldn't just be listening to folks you've heard from all the time before. Let's see who else is doing great stuff. Uh, and here are new messages from new messengers. And the series that uh, Matt and his team have put together have been called uh, Drawdown's Neighborhood, where they started in Pittsburgh, a little homage to Mr. Rogers, by the way, which I think is so cool. Uh, then to Atlanta and now to Minneapolis, St. Paul area. So later tonight at the Great Northern, the premiere of that film series uh, will be happening here today. So I hope you get to check that out. And that's just incredibly inspiring to kind of see what we can do when we look around and see the people who are implementing incredible change. So let me wrap up um, and then we'll get to some Q&A and conversation, I hope. Uh, but here's my ask of you as we wrap up today. First of all is we have to imagine a better world. Stop listening to people saying the world is going to hell and those people are to blame for it. What if we change it around and say, hey, wait, the world could be better and they could help me and I can help them. Why don't we flip the conversation? Imagine a better world. You can't have one unless you can imagine it, by the way. So let's have dreams. Let's have uh, imagination. Let's envision a better world and then talk about it. Tell people what your vision of a better world is and, and make sure we listen to other people who have their own visions as well and learn from them because nobody's gonna to get to write that script alone. We have to do this together. And then let's find ways to work together where we can collaborate and kind of weave together all of our efforts to build a better world together that we can really, really truly be proud of. And with that, we can make it a reality. And finally, I just wanna remind you just as we wrap up here, the one thing that I always wanna tell groups like this is, you know, the future is not written yet. It's still up for grabs. It's gonna be up to people like you and me and all of us to kind of take the chance, take the responsibility and consciously create the future we want. And I hope we built the case today that we do have solutions. These solutions are in fact good for us. And if we really get started and a lot more momentum than you thought is already happening behind them. So it may not be an automatic case for optimism, but maybe a cautious one 
that if we truly imagine a better future, we collaborate and put our heart and soul into this and work together, we can in fact achieve a much, much more beautiful, verdant and sustainable world. And but it's gonna be up to everyone in this room and far, far beyond it. Uh, so with that, thank you for your time and attention and I look forward to some conversations here later. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Ooh, I get the sunshine spot. Um, we're gonna do questions in a moment. We're also gonna extend the session a little bit. Um, I didn't even look behind me. Wow, you guys really filled up the room. This is amazing. Um, so we're gonna extend the session and go till about 310, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so I'm gonna ask a couple questions and then we'll open it up to you all. Uh, first, just thank you. Um, I think that, you know, we those who work in climate change can often kind of have this existential crisis from time to time is feelings of depression, you know, so it is good to remind ourselves that there's a lot of good things that can come out of this, right? There's a lot of really good solutions that have those benefits. And so I just really appreciate um, you framing that and, and giving a little dose of hope. And so, you know, we'll go through these questions and allow you to elaborate on some of that. Um, so the first you kind of focus on the Inflation Reduction Act and, and that's really, that's our best shot from the US, right? And that's that's the biggest piece of, of climate legislation that we've had. And it's very, it's a very incentive-based approach. Um, and so you you talked about, you know, this will get us 40%, but you have hope that it'll be more than that. Um, so can we do this with an incentive-based based approach in the US or are there other levers that need to be pulled? What do you, what do you see as um, the outcome of that? Well, uh... I'm a scientist and I look for evidence, regardless of what I personally believe to be true. Science is pretty good at like, hey, that might be a bias. I better check it against the data. The only things that have moved the needle on climate so far have been kind of market-based, voluntary-based, incentive-based things. We've never had a political leadership in this country that has had the political capital or dared to say, no, we're gonna regulate our way there. Uh, you would never have gotten a bill passed that said, we're going to institute a carbon tax in America. I'm taking away your hamburgers. I'm getting rid of the Ford F-150. You're like, are you kidding? Polit I'm, I know there are a few politicians in the room, so I'm not talking about you. Uh, but uh, in Washington, and not all of them, our representatives from Minnesota are pretty darn good. But um, as a whole, politicians are basically wimps and you know don't stand up to big interest. They can't because they like their gig. And they can't do that. They do that, they lose their gig, and they have to go get a real job, right? You know, that's hard. Uh, so, and again, not the ones in this room, of course. Uh, <laughs> no, really not. They're great. But as a whole, it's the difference between the political world and individual politicians. Just you know, some are doing valiant, great work, but the system they're embedded within is kind of kind of awful. And special interests, especially big oil, big ag, and others, really have a big thumb on the scale. So what seems to be working, and maybe it's the only thing that is working at the moment, I wish there were other tools, but the tools we have, and we don't have time to waste, so I'm just looking for what's working, folks, and the evidence so far is like, hey, yeah, giving people a tax break to buy a hybrid car or an electric vehicle or insulate their attic, people do it, and they don't complain about it, and Democrats didn't lose votes in the midterms passing an Inflation Reduction Act. They try to pass a Green New Deal, there wouldn't be a Democrat in Congress today, probably. So that, you know, this is kind of interesting. So I think we have to go where the politics lets us. But also remember, um, it's not just policy that matters. Um, the federal government finally is putting real money into climate, about 35 billion a year for 10 years. Venture capital in Silicon Valley alone is spending double that. Did you know that? I mean, you know, the private sector is way outspending the federal government on climate solutions. And they were doing it before, you know, we spent 30 years and we got this. The private sector has been doing a lot more and has been doing it longer. So we need both. Uh, and we need communities, we need uh, states and cities. I, I can't wait to see what happens. But the federal money can be put into things that others wouldn't and couldn't do. And I hope it will catalyze more investment from the private sector. I can't wait to see what happens in Minnesota with the, like the you know possible like bonding bills, what happens with our surplus, how much of that could be invested in long-term investments for us in our state. And also braver legislation the federal government can do like the new energy bill that's just passed in Minnesota's house. That's incredible. That accelerates action even more. And hopefully that was inspired by maybe the Fed stepping up. So I'm actually pretty hopeful. Every time we look at like what we think is gonna happen, a little bit more does. 
Uh, solar gets cheaper faster than anyone ever predicts. Wind gets cheaper, LED lighting, batteries, things like this. We need markets, we need policy, we need action, we need activism, we need community, we need it all. Um, and what seems to be working is kind of incentive-based so far. And frankly, um, I think that's how we're gonna win. When we show people like, hey, this is just better, we don't need to regulate you to tell you to do it. It's just better. You're going to do it because you want to. This is going to make your home more comfortable. It's going to save you a lot of money. It's going to make your communities healthier. And there's, you know, it's going to help address longstanding environmental um, injustices of like where the pollution is and who gets to be hit with it all the time. We can solve these things. We're going to look around and go, wait, this is just better. I don't need to be forced to do this. It's just a better world. Uh, that's my hope. And I think we'll win a lot more folks that way by showing this is just better. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of those sentiments. And then it also makes me think, you know, we're looking at this from an American perspective. Um, what does it look like in the global south? Uh, is there a cautious case for climate optimism there? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, remember the U.S. is about 11 percent of the world's emissions today. China is about 30 percent. So we're a smaller and smaller fraction of the world's emissions all the time. So other countries matter a lot. When people were talking about a Green New Deal, I said, yes, that's great, but don't forget the Green Marshall Plan. What can the U.S. do for the rest of the world? Uh, we are still, despite maybe lapsing a little bit, we are still the world's kind of innovators in new technologies, new business models, new social movements around the world almost always begin in the United States lately in the last century. Uh, so what can we do to help the rest of the world, especially countries that are still in low and middle income conditions, still facing extreme poverty, extreme health security issues, other challenges around the world, especially in the global south, and who have admitted nothing. Uh, Africa, for example, has admitted maybe 3% of the world's emissions, a continent of you know, almost a billion people and growing, uh, but are gonna be hammered by the impacts of climate change more than probably anybody in the world, the mother of all injustices. Uh, how do we solve that problem too without redirecting what we do now for helping with livelihoods, but can we do more, not just foreign aid, but in diplomacy and kind of uh, business partnerships and kind of in aid and other things, what can we do to help other countries leapfrog the fossil fueled kind of path for development into a new path that focuses on like renewable resources, sustainable agriculture, a way of improving people's lives, livelihoods, incomes, and so on, which is really critical, uh, but in doing that in a way that doesn't contribute to disaster and builds climate resilience. We have to get a lot smarter about that. Again, you know, we have to solve several problems at once, including uh, crushing poverty and injustice and inequities around the world and health issues around the world at the same time we're addressing climate change. The good news is they're kind of synergistic if you look at them the right way. Uh, the current world, the fossil fuel kind of world, that's a disaster for everybody. Uh, that's not going to be, except for, you know, the chairman of ExxonMobil maybe, but the rest of us don't do very well with that world. And yet that's the world we're entrenched in, right? And um, for now, uh, and I think that there's kind of back and forth on, uh, do we address emissions at the industry level? Do we work with these companies to reduce emissions, to change things? Um, and at the same time, our infrastructure is built so that everything kind of ends at a point. In the U.S., there's a lot of single-family homes. There's a lot of individ individual vehicles. And I don't mean individual behavior, but what does that balance look like of leaving behind that system and also being able to address kind of all of these individual pieces that we need to 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 meet those goals? Oh, that's a great question. I get asked that a lot too, because we there's kind of a weird, I think very, very false debate out there. Like we need to change the system, not individual behavior. Like individuals are part of the system. That's why it's called a system. Uh, and in fact, you do the numbers on like, where is the decision-making power for changing emissions in transportation or food or buildings? About a third of all the climate actions I just showed you have to be done at the household level. So it's not gonna be, like, Joe Biden's not gonna come change your thermostat. Sorry, he's too busy, you know, ain't gonna happen. Uh, the EPA is not gonna go to your fridge and say, you better eat that leftover and don't throw it away. Or, you know, nope, you're having the vegan burger today, not the hamburger, like, no, we have to make those decisions. So um, it's not, uh, that's a false choice. And uh, what, I, what I think that was a substitute for, that when people said we shouldn't be focusing on individual action, we should be focusing on the system. I'm like, yeah, but we have so much power in the system. The choices we make, the stories we tell, the things we do with each other in our communities and work and schools and everything else, that's up to us. Um, but I think though people are trying to avoid is the guilting of individual behavior, like, oh, let ExxonMobil or BP or whatever off scot-free 
to do whatever the hell they want and blame it all on you. Your carbon footprint is destroying the world. Well, that sucks. Nobody wants to hear that. And it's not really true. It's like you don't have a lot of choices sometimes. So instead of being a guilt trip, think of it as an empowering trip. Like, hey, wait a minute. I don't have to give my money to those bozos. I can drive by the gas station and just wave in my new uh, plug-in car. And I can, wow, my heating bill just went down in half because I finally insulated the building envelope and I got a setback thermostat and I switched to a heat pump and the government helped me out doing that. That's saving you money. It's disconnecting you from old power structures you probably didn't like and haven't helped you very much. And that's awesome. So instead of being guilty and feeling bad about your carbon footprint, think of it as an opportunity to take control, to take some power back to you and make the world you want. You only get to vote every four years in a national election. And look, you're not buying a politician. You're just renting them for the day. The other guys bought some of the politicians. You can't. I can't. But every day, you can do the equivalent of voting with your pocketbook and the stories you tell and the chats you have with your neighbors, what you say at school and what you say at work. And that's power. Why would you ever want to give that up? So if you want to take political action on climate, insulate your basement, retrofit your attic, get a more efficient vehicle. That is political and economic action every darn day, not just at the ballot box. Why would you ever want to give that up? It's a way you have to shape the world. So I, I never see that as disconnected. They're all part of the same thing. And in some places, the most important thing you do isn't voting. It's talking to your neighbors about what you're doing and talking about opportunities every day we have, not just every four years. We do that too. But what we're doing every day to kind of make your lives better and make the world a little bit better, and they're abundant, and they're going to save you money and make your life better. So why, you know, this is all good stuff if we take it that way. But don't feel guilty about it. That doesn't help. We just feel like, ooh, look what I can do now. This is awesome. Um, in my work, so I work with local governments a lot on, on climate action and increasingly have sort of changed my approach in thinking about um, talking about it and the benefits. You know, what do you want to see here? Reduce pollution, um, cleaner air, cleaner soil, those kinds of things versus reducing emissions. And, and you know, you, you highlight that toward the end there that we have all of these benefits. Um, and then you talk about taking taking the power, but how do we give the power in thinking about the most vulnerable communities, the communities that are already feeling impacts of just the everyday pollution, let alone climate change? Um, how do we give voice and give power to those communities to be able to make their own decisions? Well, that's so critical. And uh, that's why I really, really urge you all to, um, uh, I wish if you'd had a choice before going to this or tonight, you went to tonight instead. Um, I should have sent that email to all of you who registered for this. Eh, no, skip this one. Go to the thing. So tonight, um, is Matt, where's Matt? I just, can you just stand up for a second? Matt, stand up. So tell us what is going to happen tonight real quickly, if you don't mind. Hey, everybody. I'm Matt Scott. I'm our Director of Storytelling and Engagement Project Drawdown. And at the Parkway, starting at 7 p.m., we have an event, Climate Heroes, in your neighborhood. It's on the Great Northern's website. And um, it's a great time to get to meet and, and hear from some of the people who are making a great impact, um, all or mostly from underrepresented communities of different sorts and um, a lot of stories that um, here in the Twin Cities and nationally and globally um, have not been heard. So hope to see you there um, and hope that you show up starting at 7 p.m. Starting at 7 p.m. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that, and I hope you all can make it because there are so many good stories out there, and there's so many cool things that people are doing. And so I appreciate that you uh, have shared some of that with us, and we can see more this evening. And just keep looking for those stories, keep sharing those stories. Um, but I do want to transition now to open it up to you all to ask some questions for the remaining time. So, and these guys, <laughs> I'm going to go to my buddy Bruce. I know he's going to give you a hard technical question so um so oftentimes when we talk about renewable energy when we talk about some of these solutions we're thinking about now not 100 years from now mm -hmm. and to put that in perspective 100 years uh before now we were talking about how do we get kerosene out of people's homes to cut down on respiratory illnesses which gave rise to electricity everything we see today so of the solutions you shared do you see any as potentially becoming a risk to climate change once they're scaled up, particularly things like diet changes or 
adopting new technologies when billions of people start using them as opposed to just the millions today? That's an incredibly cool and thoughtful question. Um, that I can't do justice to in a short blur, but I think that kind of thinking is important. Um, so we need to think about, um, I mean, a lot of the basics we start with, like, you know, we're wasting so much of our planet's resources now, like when 40% of the world's food is being grown, how could we not find ways to cut that down? That's a no regret strategy. Uh, or making diets that our doctors tell us is healthier for us and we find are healthier for the planet. That's a no regret strategy. Uh, some of the ones though, that we, we might be locking in things where it is a little troubling, like Americans uh, just seem to have a real aversion to investing in like high-speed transit high-speed rail, real public transit that works like Japan, China, Europe, other countries that we just don't seem to do that. So are we locking ourselves into just a band-aid of electric vehicles? A hell of a lot better than petroleum-based vehicles. Way better. And don't, don't worry about the lithium stuff. That's a distraction that oil companies are paying people to muddy the waters with. We can solve that. It's a billion times less intrusive mining than oil mining is. We still have to solve it, but we can, and it's a much smaller problem than we're being told, but we still have to fix it. And we already have the problem anyway with laptops and phones. So, but I do worry about like the electric vehicle. We're just locking in kind of a weird way, which will inspire, you know, more suburban growth and more, you know, we're just gonna do the same crap in a different, better, a little bit better way. I don't know. That's the one that does trouble me a bit, um, but I don't know what the choice is. You know, I don't, it realistically are gonna switch to something a little bit better. Um, with like better rail, more walkable cities. I wish we would, but it doesn't seem to be quite in the American DNA in this country, but other places are. So I don't know. Um, that's a good question to ask. Are we doing band-aids sometimes when we've got to be thinking more systemically? Yep. Uh, but we also have to do what's possible and know that in the next, the world's changed, you know, so much in the last 50 years. I don't think humans can imagine the world hundred years from now. Uh, I really don't. What's happened even in the last 10 years is kind of extraordinary. Uh, if you, if you, <laughs> If you were a science fiction producer trying to pitch the story of what <laughs> happened in America in the last 10 years to a science fiction, you know, inv film investor, they would have like, that's crazy. Trump president, <laughs> you know, like, you know, are you kidding me? Oh, no, that's not going to happen. Like, well, um, yeah, guess what? So I don't know. Um, but I think there's some, there's some pitfalls we do have to be mindful of. The one I will mention is the fascination with bad narratives. We love the silver bullet science fiction kind of storyline where Captain Kirk swoops in on the USS Enterprise and sets the phasers to decarbonize and in the last 30 seconds saves the planet. But in the case of Captain Kirk, we're putting Elon Musk instead or Jeff Bay. No, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. There's something that a lot of people don't know called the time value of carbon. It's just like the time value of money. You don't wait till you're 64 to start saving for retirement. You have to start now and bend the curve, and it's the cumulative impact of our emissions work, not the, what we do in 2049 that matters. So far away technology solutions like carbon capture, fusion, things like this are not gonna be, mathematically it's impossible for them to be a big part of our climate solutions. They're gonna be the last 5%. What's the first 95% folks is stuff we have now. Uh, we always have a saying, a drawdown now is better than new, and time is more important than tech. So that's one of the things we have to remember is like, you know, we'll reinvent new technologies, but what we need is the ones in the hand now, because that's when you begin to bend the curve is when you start to do the work. And that means today's technology, that's probably one another pitfall is waiting too long, hoping for a silver bullet when they don't come. We could probably send those two guys to space and just leave them there. <laughs> I think, so. I'm not trying to make it personal, you know, it's cool. You know, they can do what they want just, but you know, stick to Twitter, you know. Uh, you talk. That's a great. It's great to have an awareness of the uh, global climate change. But uh, something I would like to indicate is, it's more. Uh, I don't think that's a case about uh, like, a, like a saving energy or guilt of carbon emissions. I don't think that's important because um, something more important is about how to make in, uh, investors, stakeholders, leaders in the organizations to realize there's an innovations. Uh, of certain technology uh, can reach the power and heating uh, electricity solution uh, without carbon emission. And uh, I work with renewable energy and uh, our technology is about using uh, green ammonia, but uh, a lot of the, like uh, investors and uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, organization and uh, business leader, uh, they, lack the, the, uh, they lack of the openness 
uh, of the new innovation and technology uh, can really ha being helpful, like uh, uh, without affecting the living quality of the uh, participants in the community, but also reach uh, carbon neutralization. Like uh, any advice mm -hmm. uh, would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a really great point. I mean, um, and I'm, I want to put a plug in for Minnesota um, for this is that um, Minnesota state of about 5 million people, but you know, the Twin Cities has what, 16 or so, 17 Fortune 500 headquarters, second only to New York, uh, and there are major leaders in industries like you know, 3M is in so many different areas, but especially the food system uh, here. In, this is the Silicon Valley of food is right around you right now. But also Minnesota's outstate incredible opportunity. Where do you think the renewable energy is gonna be, folks? It's out in outstate Minnesota. That's where solar, wind, biofuels, other things, and transmission lines, all that needs to be. And so I think Minnesota is poised better than most places in the world to be a pioneer in the innovations we need, not only in electricity, but also in like green, you know, like green ammonia and things like this, or other kinds of you know, biofuel technologies, next generations there, but also in terms of like agriculture, reinventing the food system, that should happen here too. And also, um, I used to work there, so a little bit um, weird for me to say this, but the University of Minnesota and other like huge technology uh, kind of partners here in the state are, are just absolutely world-class. For a state of 5 million people, we are punching way above our weight class in terms of making the better future we need in all these different areas. And I'd really like to see a lot more collaboration between communities, but also the private sector and academia to really kind of innovate and, and share, but with an end towards equity and justice. It isn't just good enough to have good technology. It has to be fair technology and be righteous and good not just cool and cheap. Uh, so that's something that we have to put our minds and hearts to. And I think Minnesota can do that probably better than anybody. And I'd like to see us do more. She's saying no. She's saying no. Oh. You're, you're, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I imagine we could probably go on much longer. And so, Sorry that we did not get to questions, but uh, I think you'll stick around for a little bit um, and you can come up and ask some questions. Uh, please do stick around. Uh, there's another session. It is going to be on exploring ecological death uh, care um, with Katrina Spade, which will be very interesting, I think. Uh, something I've been thinking a lot about. Not, you know, because there's an immediate need, but anyway. Um, I think it'll be a great conversation. So stick around and stick around up here and, and chat with folks. You can also go down to Fika and grab uh, a coffee or a little snack of Fika uh, and just enjoy the time. And we just really appreciate you all coming out here. And I just want to give one last thank you to Jonathan Foley. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.